Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to GIS Valve uh, for the second year. Uh, so we have a live case. We're going to start uh, a live case for uh, Taver. I'm using Taver term for Samir Kapadia because he's in the audience. Usually we use Tavi. So uh, I have a great panelist with us, Professor Mohammed Subhi from Egypt. Dr. Abdullah Al Khadir from Saudi Arabia, Dr. Abdullah Shahab from UAE, uh, Dr. Adil Kindi from Oman, and Professor Ahmed Jindi from Egypt as well. Uh, we have a live case from uh, King Fahad Cardiac Center from King Saud Medical City, I think uh, from Walid Al Harbi, and uh, also uh, Dr. Talal Al Jabari. So uh, I think they are ready, long time back. So, uh, without, uh, would like to welcome uh, Walid and his team uh, for this live transmission. So, Walid, can you tell us about your patients and everything, please? Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure. So, uh, before I start, I just want to introduce my uh, really A team here in uh, Riyadh. Uh, from King Saud University. I would start with uh, our head of cardiology, Dr. Ayman Al Saleh, Dr. Talal Jabari, head of our cath lab, and my colleagues here Pam from nursing, Thamir, radiographer, Zaina, Rana, Shiji, Ayman, he's our interventional fellow, and uh, Dr. Mustafa from anesthesia, and Faisal behind the scenes, and uh, Anar Faisal, our sexual health program the coordinator and Cheikha of uh, the Head Technical uh, Cap Lab. So um, we have a case that uh, we're gonna try and really uh, get your opinion and expertise. Uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. Dr. Ayman Saleh is gonna present the case. Hello, good morning uh, everybody and uh, thanks for sharing for, with us uh, your expertise. Our case today basically is gonna explore next. transfemoral tabby in patients with borderline coronary height and coexisting coronary disease. So our lady is a 75-year-old female. She has symptomatic to hear aortic stenosis. She's very symptomatic with a New York Park Associated Class 3. Her past medical history is she's hypertensive, she's dyslipidemic, diabetic, developed new onset of fibrillation and hypothyroidism. She also has bilateral osteoarthritis. Her BMI is 36.3. Next, please. So her lab is significant for people of 103, place it of 307, and her creatinine is fine. We did our her, uh, echocardiography, which demonstrated that the aortic valve was calcified with an area of 0.8. Her mean gradient was 43, her Vmax was 4.3. She had concomitant mild moderate AI, was mild to moderate MR. The LVEF is 55%. Her RBSP is 44, and she had a normal RB function with moderate PR. Next slide, please. This is her ECG demonstrating her atrial fibrillation. Next, please. This is her uh, limited views that we want to share with you. Shows a parasternal uh, law, classified aortic valve, doning on the aortic valve that is clearly shown over here. Next. This is the parasternal short axis showing calcified aortic valve. Well, barely open. We have the mean radiant of 43 across the aortic valve. Next. This is her coronary angiogram. It would be nice also to have your input uh, as we go through the kids. As we mentioned, she had concomitant coronary disease. Her LED showed show an angiogram of the left system. So we had a long disease, a long segment, and the LED, the LED artery. Next. Her chest was fine. The artery also had diffuse disease, but in the mid-segment, you have a severe, moderate to severe disease over there. Next. So now we go to her CT analysis, where her annulus area is 382, and her perimeter was 70. Next. This is the sinus of Valsalva diameter of 28, and her, her sinus tubular junction diameter of 26. This is to demonstrate a clear calcification of aortic valve 
and mostly on the non coronial left and also on the right coronal left. Next. Now, this is also something that we want to explore about the, the coronal height. As you can see that the left coronary artery height was 10.5 and the right coronary artery height was reasonable 15.5. Next. <coughs> her peripherals were predominantly okay, but she had a high bifurcation of her right femoral artery. And with this permissive diameter of her femoral and iliac, no significant or circumferential calcification. Next. Okay, so these are the points that we may discuss now or kind of leave it to, as we go on with the case, we leave it to the panelists and the input will share with you the points as we go. So well, before we start, we're just going to tell you the basic operations of our, uh, we, uh, we're going to the, dev the device sheath in the right uh, transdermal. It was ultrasound guided with fluoroscopy guidance uh, combined. Uh, to make sure we are in the above the bifurcation, below the inferior gastric artery. We went to the left femoral for the pigtail. Uh, the reason we usually go radial, but in her case, uh, she doesn't want to take out her... Uh, uh, we said, okay, we listen to you, and, and that's what we did. Um, so, I'll leave it for you. Uh, we had some questions ask you and uh, get your expertise from the panel. <coughs> I can put the slide, last one. Okay, okay. Uh, Professor Mohamed Sabhi. I will try to, to answer this question, Severs. Yes, right transfemoral roots. Uh, I will not do coronary vascular, vascular, maybe maybe FFR, uh, I have to do the right uh, platform choice because of the uh, length of to the coronary, they use the uh, Sabian trees already there. Uh, okay. already, uh, will I allow the other panelists? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Abdullah. Uh, which, which, which question do you so, want? So, use of cerebral protection, I think. Use of uh, cerebral, cerebral protection. protection. You know, uh, it's a very controversial topic. Uh, the, the evidence that we, we have. We barely can not, hear the uh, panel. Uh, uh, very helpful, but in certain right. patients. I don't think this patient is one of those that uh, weren't uh, cerebral protection. So, I'll not use it. Abdullah Shahab, regarding the vascularization of LAD. Would you do it pre, yeah. post, or you will not touch it? Yeah, unless it's a matter of debate, uh, Fahad, as you know, it really depends on the many factors. One of severity of the coronaries, severity of, you know, the valve and uh, comorbidities of the patient. So for the patient, it's very severe coronaries, I think I'll deal with that. But again, take into consideration the antiplatelets and delaying your uh, TAVI. But if the TAVI is very, you know, severe, you Again, the, the concern, this patient's atrial fibrillation, patient definitely needs anticoagulation. So it's really a matter of debate case by case. So in this case, I've maybe evaluated the um, LAD physiologically first before I deal with it. Okay. And patient presented with shortness of breath, mainly not angina. So, uh, Adel, implant technique, coplanar or cusp overlap. I guess it depends on the device you will use, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm balloon expandable, so I generally use coplanar technique. So, uh, in this case, uh, I'll do the same. Okay. Uh, Ahmed, regarding uh, closure technique, two proglide, one proglide versus proglide and angiocele or manta. Thank you, Vada. I think it's. Uh, one with the proglides, I would usually, in a relatively small femoral anatomy, I would usually deploy two proglides, but I will try to only tighten one at the end. And if I get a good result, I just cut the other one without tightening it. But I also love how they put the questions. And in terms of coronary revasque and lifetime management, they are somewhat related. So I would want to put a valve where I ensure either because of the nature of the valve itself where I ensure future coronary access, or if you use a long frame valve, you really want to have some good commissioned alignment. Because I think um, they are going to opt for the valve first. If one thing we've learned is that stable coronary artery disease, especially in the absence of symptoms, is a relatively benign condition, unlike severe aortic stenosis. So 
If you go for the valve initially, I would do that. I just want to ensure future access into those coronaries. Sure. Walid will go back to you and to tell us your strategy and uh, to tell us what you are going and to show us uh, the amazing work you are going to do. Thank you. So uh, we made a decision not to revascularize the LED uh, on the basis that, as you mentioned, uh, the lack of angina. In addition, the ejection is a fraction is normal. And uh, so we treated it as chronic coronary syndrome. And uh, we're going to proceed. Uh, if, it, if the ejection fraction is low, then the option, then we, the revascularization would be uh, uh, beneficial, especially if we're going to use a balloon expandable platform where rapid pacing might cause an uh, ischemic insult. So the decision not to revascularize, we are gonna go ahead with the rationale for that. The coronary heart height is a bit borderline. And uh, uh, that's why we elected to go with a balloon expandable platform. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna, uh, Put the stiff wire. A question for the panel. Would you use uh, LV pacing in this situation? Or usually not? Uh, I was discussing that with uh, Ahmed before. So, Ahmed, do you want to answer that? For LV so, pacing versus transvenous uh, pacing? So, I I've moved to LV wire pacing almost in every patient for the past few years. The only uh, time where I opt for transvenous pacing up front is when I have genuine concerns about high degree block. So if the patient comes in with a, a, a broad QRS complex, if we think the membrane septum is very short, so the likelihood of a conduction disturbance is going to be high, we would, this is the only time we would use transvenous pacing. But I see you, you, you are using transvenous pacing here. And I understand why in the context of, uh, of an Edwards valve. Faisal? Question to the panel, just to leave the operator with his work. Uh, I, I keep saying that coronary height is 10.4. Yep. So why, like, I keep hearing that I'm using a uh, self-expanding valve because the coronary height is 10.4. Where, where did this come from? I just want to understand why the choice of valve now uh, or the left main height is dictating the choice of valve. That's number one. Number two, again, a question to the panel is that uh, if I understand the annular area is 400 or 300, and so it, it falls in the small annuli. Uh, so is there a discussion about the choice of valve that uh, related to this patient in terms of a small annulus? And theoretically, this is not 10.4. Is that a low, a low lying left main? Good question. Yeah. Uh, I think I think these are very good questions uh, for, for, uh, from the from you uh, regarding even um, the short annulus. If you, I think it's it's better to have a, a, a supra annular because of the calcification because the, the coronary ostium. So it's to be preferred. But if you don't have this, you can, okay, you can use also a self expanding. But take care of the calcification because maybe you have post dilatation and something happening to the LED either either to protect the, the coronaries on the beginning or not. This is uh, for a question number question number two, the small annulus you said. Yes, you are right, it's twenty three here. So uh, is it need post dilatation? So we are afraid to doing block of these patients to be sure that you are not going, you are going to protect the, the, the patient properly. So that's why I don't do to crocodile okay. pacing. I think we have to have a pacing if you are afraid doing a, to have a heart block. I think the coronary height here is very safe. You can use whatever device for this case. So it's, we don't have a borderline. It's more than 10 uh, millimeters. So it's a very safe for any device we can use. Uh, Walid, I will let you explain to us what you are doing, and we can have discussions. So, people here to see your work. <laughs> Walid and the team, please, can you tell us what you have done so far? Oh, it seems we don't hear them. Can you hear us?
Okay, well, you'd hold on. Uh, it seems that we're not getting audio from your end. Can the organizers try to fix that, please? So, yeah, in the, in the meantime, the, the questions are, are quite good. I think the choice of valve in terms of anatomy, you can go with anything. There are three things you need to keep in mind. One is future coronary axis. Two is she's a relatively young lady, so there's a good chance that we would require a valve and valve procedure down the line. And three is the hemodynamics, the immediate gradient you're going to get. So this is going to be a 23 millimeter S3. You will probably get out with a slightly higher gradient than what you get with a self-expanding valve, but you make benefit of future easy coronary access and a simpler valve, Elio. valve procedure down the line. Yeah, Walid, we hear you again. Elio. Elio. Uh, Walid, can you hear us? No, I just heard you now. Okay, uh, just if you can tell us what you have done so far. So, so we, as we uh, initially uh, alluded, we went through the device sheath to the right femoral and the uh, left femoral for the pigtail, six French. We have five French for the pacemaker. And we're gonna, uh, we decided to go ahead with a balloon expandable valve platform, understanding the, uh, all the comments uh, from the audience. Speaker part. Okay, I have the line. Okay. Okay, good. So, oh. mm. the is so is this Sabian 3 or Ultra? Sabian. Looks like Sabian uh, 3. Ultra. I think the, uh, the E mark is upside down. Is it the proper wire for the tertiary of the uh, aorta? Yeah, yeah Lunderquist would be ideal. I mm. agree. Gonna cross here. I really prefer okay. Okay, more wine. Okay. Mm. Okay. We're gonna push a bit further and then go back. Just LB, so uh, okay. Good. <coughs> okay. Okay, you can pull the small. Just give me one second, just release the balloon. Okay. 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 You can pull back. We need to pull back. Yeah. Let me pull back. Okay. Alas, okay. Walid, are you going with 50-50 or 80-20? No, so, yeah, because of that, uh, the calcium is a bit, the calcium burden is low by CT. So uh, I don't want to go to 90-10, usually that's where I go. Uh, but I'm going to uh, try to go 80-20. So our, my, our goal here is the inferior border of the middle marker. Although the balloon is a bit... Uh, Centered. Okay. Okay. We're gonna do testing. That's a rapid pacing. Make sure it's stable. Small LV and it's a bit irritated. Okay. Can you go pacing 180? Uh, uh, let's go to the view first. Uh, wait. Uh, can we go to the blunt view first? Wait, wait, just stop. Yeah. I just want to make sure the pacing is working. Guys, if we can have the hemodynamic screen displayed as well, that would be great. <clears throat> Joel, can you share the hemodynamic screen, please? Okay. Um, okay. Do you see the hemodynamics, uh, Dr. Fahad? Not yet, no, really, not yet. we don't want to keep you at a critical moment. You just go ahead and display it. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, okay, small test. Uh. Yeah, we have it now, great. We do see it now. Okay, it's a lot of PVCs. So let's go pacing 180. And then adjust 180. Okay. Hamal do you want to comment? Walid. Take off. Walid, wait, wait. Pace make off. Walid. Nice case, Walid. Walid. Just make sure of the central marker. Uh, the balloon is down, so this yeah, is not in the middle. Yeah, don't pay attention to the central marker. Probably that lucent, uh, the lucent off. area. So make sure of that. I agree with you. <coughs> okay. So, okay, it's good pacing. We'll go. 
Well, uh, what about uh, Dr. Fahad and the panel? Are you okay with that uh, last uh, picture? Can I have an injection picture? Please? Can you play it again? Not safe. Let's see. Oh, not let's, safe. Let's okay. Let's do it. No, it's down. It's too deep. We have to get up. That's more of 50-50. Right. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna put it back. And uh, uh, I think also there is a tension on the system itself. It's hugging the uh, inner curvature of the aorta. So you might change some of your orientation. It will also make you more aligned with the aortic root. Yeah, thank you. Uh, because these tertiaries of the wire cannot support the yes. valve. I don't know if adding more curve on the catheter is going to help with more better alignment. She's more, if you push more in the wire, it will make it coaxial and maybe land it above because it's too deep in this one. She, she has very uh, small LV, so this is, we are at the apex right now. Um, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Test statement. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay, we're going to go ahead with this uh, level. Okay. Ready? Okay. Pacemaker on. Okay. okay. Okay, sure. No, no, no. I think you might release okay. some flexion a little okay. bit. Flexion okay. the way. Go ahead. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Pacemaker on. Okay. Pacemaker off. Good. Walid, I have seen that what? you are jailing the pigtail. So what's your... I usually, I never, I never pull it. I never pull it. Uh... Yeah, neither do I. Okay. Give me a J1. Axial time. Okay, go... Uh... Bit more opposite, parallel. Remove parallax. Okay, more. more. Perfect, parallax, one cast. Okay. Pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll. Go more coral a little bit, just remove parallax. More, more. Uh, more. Can we see the pressure, please? <coughs> yeah, we're going to get it shortly. Miss coral. Miss coral. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to attach it shortly. Okay. Uh, a bit tail, we'll need to yeah, keep it. Yeah. I'm just going to put it over Yes, there. please, that's good. Thanks. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. results. So I think that my comment is, uh, if you have a valve that is not well aligned and well coaxial, probably inflating more slowly is, will give you more time to adjust and, rea to, and react to any last minute uh, changes if needed. Uh, I think they've done an excellent job, but uh, I think the balloon inflation was too quick. Fair enough. Good point. Okay. Ready for the angiogram? Yep. Yeah, bismillah. Well, looks good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how much you call it here? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's have a watch. The, the position is okay, and uh, you can see that there is no BVL in the aortogram, and the and coronaries are filling. Yeah. Are you going to check the hemodynamics as well? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Given uh, the comment about uh, using a using a self-expandable valve, it's very crucial to the gradient here as a baseline. Post tabby, okay. okay. Take so it out and flex. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, let's hold it. Have the wire? I don't <clears throat> Just, uh, um, I'm going to ask the panelists until we get the hemodynamics. Uh, 
would you jail the pig tail? That's that a routine practice. And if you jail the pig tail, how safely you remove it? Because sometimes you could embolize it. No, I didn't jail it. Yes. You don't jail. I don't jail. Abdullah, I try not to, but sometimes you know, like, uh, with the rush of the uh, situation, you just forget it. I, I don't think it's a major concern if you forget it, if you if you leave it. But I tend to remove it while I'm, I'm plating. So w you will remove it using a wire to straighten it. Uh, always, yes, you're right. Yeah. Always, yeah. The wire. always use the wire. I used to, I used to take out the pigtail. Uh, I, leave, I take out the pigtail before I implant, and then uh, after many discussions uh, with colleagues, and uh, I changed my practice. Okay. It's a step that it does it. Uh, I haven't seen it ever that this has been an issue. Probably it's an issue when you have no sinuses are very small. Well, in all honesty, regardless of how big the sinuses are, how much the calcium is, I've always okay. left the big tail with the balloon expanding platform. Just remove it over the wire like you did, and I've never seen it do any problems either with me or, or with anyone else. Obviously, it's different with self-expanding platforms. <clears throat> Besides, it serves like a fantastic marker throughout the procedure, especially at the time of deployment. So I think there, there might be some Sometimes added benefit. You you're right. Sometimes you, when you're in the middle, you have a PVC or something, you still have Yeah. That's a good point. Waleed, it's an excellent result, mashallah. But I will not leave the big tail. In fact, this is the updated practice, you see. You shouldn't leave the big tail. You, see, you should pull it little up and then you test. So probably this is a, an extra safety measure. Uh, if you lift it, then you have to put a wire. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah. <clears throat> Point well taken. Great hemodynamics. Abdullah. No gradient. Uh, just my comment about the risk of coronary obstruction, just to answer uh, Dr. Fayez's question. So there's a paper looked at 50 cases who had coronary obstruction, and they looked at the factors that's related to it, and one of them was the choice of valve. So balloon expandable is actually at higher risk of causing coronary obstruction. And the coronary height is another uh, factor. The third factor is the sinuses. So if you have small sinuses, the risk of obstruction is higher. And gender of the patient, so female patients are at higher risk. So, uh, of course, the technology you use has an implication on the risk of coronary obstruction. So the, using something like self-expandable, like an Evolute technology, uh -huh. has that waist that moves away from the coronary. I think the best one to use is the accurate knee if you are really concerned. Because the, the way the valve designed, it pulls the leaflets a little bit away from the coronary. So it, it is a factor. Okay, thanks, Abdullah. Just we'll see the hemodynamics, Mohammed. Okay, Walid, your comment about the hemodynamics, please. Yes, you can see here, there's uh, some PVCs, but uh, almost uh, zero gradient. The LVDP, uh, it's, it's, about about, it's about 20, and that's what we started about 25, 19. Uh, no probable leak on the, uh, on the aortogram. We're going to look good. at the axis now. As we always say, never declare victory early. Do, do you do an echo also? Mm -hmm. We have an echo here. We have Zena. Uh, she's going to do the echo uh, shortly. And okay. we can uh, show you the images. Okay, until you do the echo, I'll take more uh, comments or questions Zena. from the audience. Mohamed Bel Ghaif. Walid, very nice case. Congratulations for you and your team as usual. And I think what we did in the many years, we used to pull the, routinely to pull the big tail back. And I think now with most of the valve, even accurate new, I left the big tail in the same place and we are doing very well, but I will take it with the wire very carefully. Uh, number two, the conduction delay with the, uh, and uh, with the uh, balloon expandable. A lot of time you see a conduction delay, but fortunately enough, with such type of valve, you see a lot of changes and uh, re regression to the normal conduction on the same table, actually very fast, which is very reassuring. That's usually a trauma from the balloon. You're absolutely correct. Usually traumatic middle balloon. Dr. Ahmed. Yeah, uh, I will uh, apologize up front. I'm not an interventional, but I have uh, seen... You are a uh, 
CT intervention. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> so I have seen a couple of cases where there is uh, the, the coronaries are sealed, especially right coronary artery, if the, if the root is small. And uh, the reason I thought that some of the bulbs are, the skirt is not the same height from all the aspects. So some aspects is higher than the other aspects. So is there any way to, like, to manipulate during the implantation that, you know, those, the skirt where height, which is a little bit lower, is going to be facing the coronaries rather than the other uh, face? I mean, that might decrease, especially with the smaller root, might decrease the obstruction of the coronaries. I'm seeing faces jumping to answer this question. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I, was, I, was, I was here to just congratulate you read a great case, but uh, he showed us a beautiful hemodynamics, and then you asked for an echo. And honestly, nowadays, I only ask for the echo for the fusion, because always my gradient with the echo is disappointing. Uh, that is why uh, we, should, yeah, we should not pay attention a lot to the immediate uh, gradient because the patient is anesthetized, uh, sleepy, but I think the echo before discharge and four weeks are very important. This echo that they are doing in the table is very important for immediate bar leak and, and fusion, and, uh, uh, and if there is an effusion. But I think the result hemodynamically is amazing. The gradient here is almost near zero, and congratulations on a great, great uh, case. Great, Sorry, I'm not great ask. comment. Oh. I'd, um... I was expecting this question uh, from Dr. Faisal. Dr. Faisal is actually uh, he's my teacher when I was in Calgary. So um, I'm, I'm really privileged that I worked with him. Well, a good question. The reason we do the echo mainly uh, because we do, uh, we adopted the same day discharge of TAVI. So we, didn't have, we have a baseline uh, before the patient leaves and then a follow up in one week and a phone call the next day. Uh, and that's the major reason. We don't want to go and then uh, do the echo in the, uh, in the inpatient setting. We just get finished, access access in six hours, patient mobilizes, no conduction issues, uh, then we move the patient, uh, then he can be discharged. That's part of our uh, uh, pathway. Well, it, the, the echo results are fantastic. We're seeing zero leaks, a mean gradient of four. Congratulations, guys, excellent results. Um, and I think for, for lifetime uh, purposes, as you quite rightly mentioned early, early on, you, you did this patient a solid, even if she comes back 10, 12 years down the line, you'll still be able to put in another valve with a, with a very good hemodynamic result. So, Fad, any, any comments Thank on this? Good. So we, we have a great result converted by aortogram, by hemodynamics, by echo, so great results. Uh, Walid, uh, my question to you is uh, what you are going to do about closure here? You gave us all well, the we options, have, we, but we need to know your strategy. Yeah, we are already committed to two uh, proglide. We have a very generous, uh, as Dr. Ayman alluded, that uh, uh, CFA. So uh, usually if it is really borderline, uh, what I do, I do two proglide, a uh, uh, suture-based uh, device, and I put the first one, if I have a good hemostasis, I just break the second one to minimize the risk of complication. Uh, if it's still not achieving uh, proper hemostasis, uh, I uh, deploy the second uh, proglide. Uh, NG seal with proglide, I'm really, uh, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, uh, as a plug base, uh, usually the reason I use a suture base, the proglide or the pro style, it's very safe. You have a troubleshooting uh, bailout that is really predictable compared to uh, uh, and a plug based uh, device. That's my personal opinion. Uh, I would like to hear from the panel. Dr. Fad. So there was yes. a question on the skirt. What do you think on the skirt? We'll get back to Alit's point. On, I totally agree with his, with, with his strategy with vascular closure with, with smaller anatomies. But what do you think of the skirt? So skirt-related coronary obstruction. Uh, do you see it? Mechanism? Where do you get alarmed? Uh, the question for me? No, it's for the panel, Walid, but we're also keen oh, okay. to get your input. Any one of the panelists want to tackle this? Hmm? I... 
So I, I, can, you, can you repeat your I question? Think we're, we're talking about skirt-related obstruction, and it's a, it's a very good question from, a, from an imaging perspective. But there are only two th scenarios where you can get skirt-related obstruction. It's either sinus sequestration. So here, the, the uh, width the of the sinuses per se or the root is not the main issue. It's the height of the sinotubular junction. So if you have a very low sinotubular junction and you use a large stent platform or a long stent platform, then you risk sequestrating the sinuses altogether. The second time where skirt-related coronary obstruction becomes a factor is a new skirt caused by a valve and valve procedure. So if you're putting, and this usually relates to putting a balloon-expanding valve in a self-expanding valve, there you extend the skirt significantly. So these are two areas where you really want to think about skirt and the possibility of sinus sequestration. Uh, I think there is another thing also about the skirt. I'm Hisham here. So I think is from the imaging perspective, what I understand from the question is that uh, for the self-expanding valves, the commissure, this is where you can see with the CT scan that all this part in front of the commissure is totally a block. So if you're doing the CT, then you can see from the base of the valve till the commissure, this is all opaque. There is no concentration at this point. And this is where you, the commissure alignment, alignments plays a role. So if I understand the question right, yes, sometimes if you can see with a CT scan, one on the right, if you're not doing the commercial alignment correctly, then at, part, at one part of the valve, then you can see the skirt going all the way up, and on the other part, it's not going up. So this is also when you have to do the commercial alignment uh, first. The question about the closure, I wanted to ask him, would you reverse the heparin or not? And the, th the second thing is that doing a balloon expandable valve and having a get great hemodynamics, would you remove the temporary pacemaker wire on table or you wait in the uh, ICU? Thank you so much. You finished all the questions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So, Walid, we are back to you to show us the closure. Yeah, we, uh, we already finished the, the and device, Chief. And we don't uh, need to see the echo anymore. You can take it out, Joel, from them. So we close the right line. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, I know Samir has a technique for that. Uh, Samir Kabadia, please. No, I just uh, wanted to ask you a question that how many of you use the same side? Because I, for the last three, four, five years, we have not been using two sides. So just use the same side for this inferior sheath. So you have to take one picture, close it. Patient has only one side access. The uh, risk is extremely safe. It is extremely safe. Uh, Samir, not minimalist, but two Sa sheets. Samir, I know you use only one side. So it will be good if you explain it to, to everybody. So what I, what I normally do is first put a uh, first sheath, the higher sheath, put one proglide, eight front sheath, then stick just underneath, two finger below, in the common femoral, in the just above the bifurcation, and then put a five front sheath in it. Put a straight flush. Instead of a pigtail, I use a straight flush, so you don't have to remove it. So the question that came up, is to say that you have to remove the pigtail or not, but there is a straight catheter available with multiple holes, which is a straight flush catheter. So you can use a straight flush, so you don't have to remove it. And then at the end, you just take a picture from the, take out the top one. I like angiosil, so if there is one proglide and one angiosil. And then at the end, just take a picture from the bottom. And if it looks good, just hold pressure and take it out. Or if you want to put a device, you can put a device. Mm -hmm. So this way, you don't have to go into groins. And when you want to intervene, if there's a problem, much easier, because you are right there in the groin. So you can just balloon it. You don't have to cross over. You don't have to do anything. Just go from the bottom, put a balloon, and uh, you will be done. You can even put a stand, but we never have to put a stand these days. But just a balloon is usually good. So, so me, does anyone nice, else nice use strategy. that? Sorry? Does anyone else in the panel oh, use that on the floor? No. I, see. I think it's, it's excellent. I've, I would say I use it in like 50% of instances. The only factor that drives me away from it is a, a theoretical concern, which hasn't really happened, that my proglide suture at the end, I end up 
inadvertently tightening over, actually leave a, a four French rather than a five French sheath. And the fact that sometimes I realized that my puncture was in the SFA, with a four French sheath that's also fine, but you end up with a bit of hematoma because you inadvertently go through part of the quadriceps. So the, the perclose will not, proglide will not catch it because if you do proglide first, Yes. So do I the f first sheath, do the proglide, and then, then stick, stick the lower one. If you put the lower one first and then try to, then you will catch it. Yeah. But if you don't, then you shouldn't catch it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question to the panel and uh, uh, the audience. Uh, is uh, doing a final angiogram to the closure, is it a routine? Is it a must? Does anyone do it? Or if, if we're clinically happy, and the patient has good size femoral, we have good hemostasis, do we have to do angiogram? For me, yes. Um, I don't know. Yes, I'm doing uh, routinely to be sure that uh, nothing happened and the arteries will be ready for the cover stent or, or uh, maybe a crossover. Hassan. I think, you, so I think you have to do something. If it's an angiogram, that's fine. If it's an ultrasound, that's fine. As long as you check one way or the other, that's important, but I wouldn't place much emphasis on having to be an angiogram. Yeah, no, no. This is... Okay, so. yeah, thank you again. I mean, I um, um, concur what Dr. Samir Kipadia said as well. So we have actually adopted a unilateral axis. Uh, uh, we try as much as possible not to do bifemorals. So sometimes the common iliac is very small and it couldn't accommodate two unilateral axes. We do radial and femoral, so to decrease the risk of bleeding. The, most of the bleeding that you can see in the event registries are from the contralateral, not from the lateral. Yes. So the only issue with the radial is that if you want to do really balloon tampon, so we do some peripheral work, so we have a long balloon that we can take from the radial down and tampon out it if we need to do that. The, one of the issues that we find with the unilateral axis is sometimes to negotiate a five French pigtail in a tight area would be a little bit challenging. And we have tried to use the straight flush catheter as well. But occasionally when the, when the you know, size is a calcified or tortuous as, uh, area, we do have difficulty in, in taking it up a five French pigtail because of flimsiness and lack of support. So, but we have adopted that strategy and actually the bleeding is much, much less and it's all ultrasound guided uh, with the micropuncture technique. Usually, most of the complications happening from the other side. Exactly. Yeah. No, just uh, one technical side is that first put the pigtail, so then put the big sheath. Yeah. So, or I like the straight flush, so I put the first straight flush, then put the big sheath. So, straight flush is already there, so you're not putting it afterwards, mm. because otherwise it will be difficult to put it afterwards. Yes. So, put it first, and then if you sometimes, if you're tortuous artery, leaving a stiff wire in there can also help to put the large sheath in. So the large sheath will be even easier if you have a wire next to it, sometimes with a very tortuous. Samir, the, Samir the, if I summarize this, you usually you do your proglide, prepare your proglide, single proglide, put, and then do the other puncture for the pigtail, take the pigtail, and then put the sheath. That's, That's right. the order. That's the order. Right? Yeah. One other technical aspect, which are, because we have, we've used it and uh, adopted from the Cleveland Clinic, I put a little bit of a distance so that in case of a, you know, a complication that happens, I have room to go up. So I go a little bit about seven centimeters below. Oh. The, yeah, I, go I usually more. put my, my fingers are smaller, but two fingers, so I would say three, three centimeters below. And I don't even ultrasound or anything, just take it. So, gentlemen, we have the ladies waiting for two hours. <laughs> Russia, please. No worries, it's okay. We, we can stand in the cat lap, so we can tolerate this. Um, uh, great results, uh, Dr. Wadid and the team. Uh, just a couple of comments on access. I think the more we do radial and femoral, we've, we've had way less complications. So I would stick with the radial, and you can still balloon tamponade, and rarely you would need a covered stent in these cases, maybe one in, in a year that you would, and that's when you um, have to do a trans, uh, another femoral approach. Um, another comment that I wanted to make earlier about the small annulus, the ocean tavi actually, their definition of very small is 314, so way less than when your patient is. Your patient is more of the 
uh, upper limit of small annulus in the trials up to 400. So I think you, the, your choice of valve for a, a balloon expandable is good for coronary access mostly. Um, and then the last comment is that some people advocate for doing a coronary access after just because we know that she, this person has a moderate LED disease, moderate to severe, so your choice of a catheter afterwards would be easier to document in your note that, you know, easily accessible with this uh, catheter or guide. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Walid, so we are back to you. Yes, so uh, the practice we do with a vascular device closure usually, uh, we put in, uh, if there is good hemostasis after the second progolite deployed, we check the pulse distally. If there's a good pulse, then we just, uh, we don't need to do any uh, uh, femoral angiogram. If there's any... Uh, uh, from before screening that we suspect the high risk uh, of complications, then that's a case where we really we do a, a contralateral injection to make sure that uh, uh, there's no uh, local complication. Otherwise, we do not do it routinely uh, we, if the pulse is palpable distal uh, to the puncture site. So I couldn't hear you. Did you do final angiogram for the peripherals or not? No, we don't. We do not do routinely unless uh, we don't feel pulse distal to the puncture site. Not even an ultrasound? Nope. nope, we don't do it. We don't do ultrasound, we don't do a femoral angiogram unless there, we suspect it's a high. A high so you are confident yeah. enough. Yeah. Uh, hmm. No, nice. but this, uh, we change our practice. Usually we used to do femoral angiograms. Uh, if there's any suspicion, we do ultrasound. But if you have a good pulse distally, Let's say if you have a dissect, local dissection, non-flow limiting, you're going to leave it if you have a good pulse distally. Uh, so I really uh, uh, avoided doing the terminal angiogram uh, unless, as I, as I said, I don't feel a pulse distal where I not uh, propose, or I predict there is, might be complication if I have severe calcification, borderline uh, vast uh, CFA. And that's the case where I uh, be vigilant uh, in assessing uh, uh, suture base uh, device order. Okay. Yeah, is that, uh, Good. Uh, regarding the anticoagulation, because patient is uh, an atrial fibrillation, so what's your uh, uh, management for the anticoagulation, antiplatelets, especially in the presence of coronary artery disease here? Uh, good point. Uh, Usually, uh, with a chronic uh, coronary, uh, coronary heart disease, and uh, I use uh, abixaban uh, as a choice. I do not use rivaroxaban, so or uh, would use uh, warfarin. But in this case, we're going to use abixaban. No antiplatelets. That's it. Oh. No antiplatelets. I mean, you, you don't use dual therapy for for some time, on, and then you go for uh, abixaban. Uh, no, we used to use to give one. Uh, uh, we used to do dual antiplatelet for a few months, and then we switched to mono, mono antiplatelet, uh, and then we changed after the newer studies. Just with that would be enough. But for this, uh, I just use an oral anticoagulant without using uh, antiplatelet. I would like to hear from you guys if what uh, what's your practice? Anyone will use an antiplatelet here. If we are not doing any revascularization for that LAD legion. So, so the reason, no, not high. The reason to use the antiplatelets for what? Secondary prevention or primary prevention? It's most like primary prevention because we don't have, we don't have end or, you know, yes. organ damage at the moment. No, no, it's, it's secondary. It, you have a disease already. You know? Yeah, but, but no symptoms. But even you stented or not stented, I mean, if you stented, you make triple one week and then you give a plavix or, or take a girl with the, with the, with abtixapen. But if you know, no revascularizations. The question now is to give an aspirin with a or not. This is the question. Now. Yeah, patient already not on antiplatelets. Patient came for TAVI. You had the TAVI patient ah, on yeah. AF. So patient need protection from stroke point of view. Yeah, yeah okay. we understand the indication for the uh, oral anticoagulation. But what's the indication for the uh, antiplatelets? It's not indicated because there is no stent. There is no indication. I think the only concern that we used to have in the older days is the first three months, whether anticoagulation, especially with the NOAC, is sufficient to prevent leaflet-related thrombosis or thrombosis around the frame. 
Nowadays, we know this is, this is absolutely unsubstantiated, and the practice would be oral anticoagulation, and that's it. There is no indication for an antiplatelet here, I think. Yeah. Can I this is I one agree. part we already know. I mean, if we are not going to do any revascularization for that LAD lesion, only anticoagulation is more than enough. Okay, okay I'm uh, Dr. Ehsan Rafi from Qatar. Uh, very great case, uh, thank you. I would like to ask the panels, uh, as a like, quick survey, how many percent of your patients you do pre-dilatation uh, of the valve before uh, the deployment, either for sizing or to, to have a better preparation? And also, secondly, how many percent of your patients roughly you use cerebral, cerebral protection device? For balloon expandable? No, just in any case, uh, like before valve deployment, no. just do pre-dilatation for any type of valve. You mean what's the indication of pre-dilatation in any case no. or such no, case? No, just the in your practice, case. your practice. Okay. Your practice, how many Anyhow, percent of for cases? Balloon expandable, we don't pre-dilate anymore, mm. okay? And uh, for self-expandable, it depends on the device, so. I think you can't answer that question without take it, putting this into consideration. If it's a balloon expanding and that's mostly your practice, you're probably doing very little pre-dilatations. I would say the only indication with a balloon expanding valve is when you have significant concerns about being able to cross the valve. So let's say if it's a yes. bicuspid valve, type 1 with a calcified raffia and a bit of horizontal water, then you might use pre-dilatation just to ensure that you cross it smoothly and it gives you some stability with the hemodynamics as well with self-expanding valve I think it's the same around the panel if it's an accurate new 2 I would do like 90% of the times if not 100 pre-dilatations and with Evolutes it's like 50-50 what so, about you uh, Abdullah? Ahmed what are the tricks and this is for all the panelists sometimes you go and it's difficult to cross with the valve so what are the tricks that you, you use to uh, facilitate uh, passing the valve through the uh, analyst. So again, is that related to a balloon expanding or a self-expanding? No, no, I'm, so, I'm talking about balloon expandable. About body wire. Yeah. Sometimes body wires. No. So yeah, well, body wire is one thing. I would say make use with balloon expanding platforms. The ability to shape your delivery system is fantastic. So just make use of that. And make use of the capacity with the newer platforms to flex to a very acute angle. And that would usually do the job. But sometimes knowing this problem up front, so getting a stiffer wire, a LondoQuest, for instance, would, would facilitate that. Um, a body wire would occasionally help. Sometimes. Getting a balloon, a second balloon. system with a balloon and dilating next to that, Again. because you obviously don't want to or you can't really retrieve the valve backwards. So I think these are all options. But what I've learned is when I think that the crossing is going to be a, an issue, a gentle pre will always make life easier rather than getting too fancy. I think you have to ask yourself why the device doesn't cross. Is it due to stretch of the wire? You, can, you, you have that's, to change the wire. Factor, yeah. or, or it is yeah, very calcified, very yeah. tiny, so you need pre dilatation. Or sometimes the angulation, so you have a body wire. Wa so wa depending on uh, what Walid, it Walid and your team, please, what, uh, uh, how you tackle this? if you are having difficulty with balloon expandable crossing the valve? That's a challenge. Um, uh, so if, if that's the case, uh, I try to avoid to be in that situation. If I know the calcification burden is high, I would do a with the same balloon of the valve. I guess sometimes if you flex more, you rotate a little bit, you can go Sometimes you can inflate a little bit, just the tip of it, that will facilitate. And finally, if you fail, you can come from the contralateral side and uh, do dilatation. Yes, Abdurrahman. I think the underestimating the problem is the cause of uh, failure to cross because the, uh, there are certain criteria you have to follow. Heavy calcium, uh, if it is more than 1,200 or uh, uh, 1,300, it's, it's a predictor of failing to cross the calcium. Bicuspid valve with calcified raffae, it's an indication to, to go and predilate. Uh, so because the uh, uh, Sabian is, is, is challenging to uh, pull it back, and if you pull it back, you have to change the whole system again, because you will take the uh, sheath and then you change the uh, delivery system again. So uh, maybe the, uh, with the self-expandable is easier because you retrieve with the Merrill, you can retrieve and, and uh, go back again. But with Sabian, it's difficult. But uh, to sort it out while in 
Uh, I think from going from the uh, contralateral axis, upgrade the, side, the sheath and uh, go with the balloon uh, and inflate the uh, bredilate while you're far from the ascending or tower and descending, go back again. Happened with us uh, sometimes, but uh, uh, it's try to don't retrieve the, uh, the valve to waste the device unnecessarily. So uh, play around it. Th thank you, Abdurrahman. I would like to go to Riyadh and Dr. Walid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, Walid and your team, congratulations for an excellent demonstration of implanting a valve in the aortic uh, area. Thank you very much, and excellent results. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, also, I'd like to thank all the panelists, Ahmed Abdullah, Adil, uh, Mohammed Subhi, and I would like to thank you for being patient with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one.